Rosen for our third in interview. Okay, we will. We want to start right after delib deliberation. Yes. Um, how long did you remain in the DP camp? Well, before that, did we do anything about my liberation? Did we talk about mm -hmm. that how I was liberated? You so this comes first. Yeah. Right. That first. I was liberated. Well, I did talk about the dead marches. Mm -hmm. Right. The second dead march from Buchenwald yeah. that I wind up in Theresienstadt. So we, we came to one place. There were two Russian planes. Every five minutes they came over, and they shut up with machine guns the locomotives to disable them because they were ever so many trains were there, and from all from all over Europe probably they took them to different places from Buchenwald, from Dachau away, from different places. They didn't know where to, where to take him. And there, they disabled our train. So two of them got wounded. So we all jumped out and we thought we can escape. But there was one train with military, German, German military. They rounded us up. And at that time, I met a young guy who was only about 13 years old. I know how he survived, but he went not as a Jewish guy in the camp, but as a poor. Cosman, mm -hmm. his name. He was a neighbor of mine, the terror door. He says, you come in, they don't know I'm Jewish, you come into our transport and you'll be safe. I says, no, you come into my transport, we'll be together. I have here friends that they with me in the other camp. So far, I am lucky and I don't want to break my luck. I, I had a feeling. And so, after a while, he went back to his transport, which all Polish people, that later on I found out that the Germans shot the whole transport where he was. I met his sister after the war, in Volare, and I told about, but later on, about a year later, we found out that the whole transport, the Polish transport, got killed. So I'm glad I didn't go with him. So, then we went to Dresden, when we marched by foot to Theresienstadt, we passed the Resden, where the Resden was on fire at that time. And I was so happy, so glad, because you remember when I said that they made us wash our clothing, wash ourselves in the Elbe River in Dresden, mm -hmm. and so many people died. It was such a windy and cold weather, so I was glad everything was burning. And finally we managed to come in the evening to Theresienstadt. Came to Theresienstadt, right away they gave us hot coffee to drink, with a hot soup with bread, but they didn't have a place where to put us overnight to go in the barracks, because they came from all over Germany, only Jewish people, that they singled out Jewish people in the other camps, to Theresienstadt. Theresienstadt is the reason they selected, because they have a gas chamber there, and they taught in the final the final days, they're going to gas us all up there. But it happened, what I heard later, that the German officer let know the Red Cross what's going to happen. So the Russian army, instead of going first to Prague, liberate other cities, they came first to Theresienstadt and they liberated us. Well, I don't know what happened with me because in the next morning, they put us to a barrack. I remember I was in the Hamburger Kaserne. They called it Kasernes, every, every, not black, but big houses. And we were about 30 people in that room. And a few of them died because they couldn't make it. You know, they died in the room. And maybe on typhus, because it was typhus epidemic. And what I know, I must have jumped out the window because I was in the room when the Russians, the Russians came in. But they found me on the ground. I must have jumped out. Maybe I didn't know what I'm doing. Maybe I saw dead people and I jumped out. And I know I would never know if I was there a day, two days, or three days. I would never know. But what I remember, like in a dream, that I heard some partisans singing like a Russian song. This is what I remember. And when they woke me up, was a Russian soldier with the Czech partisan. They woke me up with some word and this I got up and they took me back to the room. If you want something to eat there, come there, which I didn't have even strength to walk. And I went back to the 
went back to the room there where, where I was, but it wasn't any more 30 people. It was about 15 left that thought they must have died or and they took him away. And the following day, while I was arrested, was there one guy, I don't know who he was or nothing, but he must have been a couple. Why? Because he looked so hefty and healthy. And I know how he got out from Therese and stuff, because it was all quarantine day. They didn't let nobody to check. Police were there with the Czech soldiers, uh, because they didn't want to spread all over Czechoslovakia at that time. So they didn't let nobody out. And he came back with a horse and wagon, two horses, those Belgium heavy horses that you see in advertisement from the beard, how they drag, and a whole platform with German money, he must have gone to a bank there, which we used it for toilet paper. We didn't have paper, everybody had diarrhea, you know, at that time. We didn't have what to go, we didn't eat nothing, but some of them, probably what they ate there from the kitchen, get off the table. <laughs> I want this to be there. And, and we ate sardines, those uh, Portuguese sardines, those big cans with the golden labels, and wine. And we drank so much wine. That's all we had, no bread, no nothing. Just sardines for about two days. And then came in a nurse from the Red Cross, took me there to be examined by the doctor, because they have their a Czech doctor and from the Russian army a doctor. And they examined everything. Then he asked me, what did you eat? And I told him. He said, you pretty lucky, because if you wouldn't have the wine, you wouldn't be here to talk to us. This is the worst thing you could do, because sardines are oily, fat, and we couldn't take any fat in at that time. The stomachs were not adjusted to anything, but the wine rescued you. So he says, don't do this no more, and they gave me some food. But the Russian army came in with their big field kitchens, what the army ate, with bacon and, and meat. They put so much meat on, and people died like flies. Their stomach was shrank, you know, they didn't eat for two, three weeks. And he has had so dinner, they just couldn't move the bars. They, Everything was inside shrunk. They didn't. I know from one a black health that was with me in camp. He just couldn't move for two weeks his bowels. And he cried, he yelled for pain, everything. They couldn't do anything with it. And I was so careful. I didn't want to eat that. The only thing I ate was a potato out with it, with the bread and some milk. That's all. You see, when the American army liberated prisoners from camps, they didn't let them eat nothing. They gave him like baby food. It depends in what condition you are. They examined you and all baby food they gave. Not even milk, not chocolate, not anything. The Russians gave you chocolate. This was the worst thing. Yes. Cigarettes, they thought they'd do you a favor, but they didn't know. But the American army, little by little, with gradually, they, they increased the volume of food and gave him good food not fat or anything, so they were happy. But, but the Russians was a different thing. But I was there for about a week. The epidemic was terrible. They start burning the barks, you know, because it was full of lies and everything. That's what brought the epidemic. People didn't wash for weeks and slept around the other to keep warm. And, uh, and there were mountains of dead, like in Dachau. And if you go there to the cemetery in Therese, you see one guy has 12,000, one has 38,000 people, and a lot of my friends, they were with me camp up there, day. I know, because I saw them there, but they didn't make it. Two of them that they were from my city did make, because I met them later in Israel. And in one time, somebody was calling me, and I know who, and it was my sister's husband. He was, he lived in Warsaw, he was, he was a secretary for JNF before the war. Yeah, highly intelligent person. In fact, he, he was the only Jewish correspondent from the uh, survivors that he was at the Nuremberg trial. And I was there several times because he could take along two guests every day for each session. 
So my sister went there, my other brother, I went there. And he took his son's passport because they didn't let out nobody there. But he said he's a newsman from the press. And I went out as his son that I came in with him. So how long was this after the Russians came and liberated Theresa? That I saw about after two weeks. After two weeks. After okay. two weeks. What happened every day in Europe from 10 o'clock to 2 in the morning, from each camp that they were liberated where people who were survivors, they mentioned the names. From which city, the name I came. So he heard on the radio, I'm alive, I'm Theresienstadt, so he came to pick me up. So what happened, he took me out, it was about 4 afternoon, we went, take what I'm going to take, I don't have nothing, just one shirt, but they gave me a clean shirt, a clean pair of pants, and that's all. Because the other thing, they burned it. It was everything, you know, they didn't want to keep anything what somebody wore, they burned it. I wish I would have my uniform, what I, my pyjama that I wore in camp. Because I would have given it to the museum, I would have for myself for display, just for souvenir, but it didn't happen. And we had to walk to the, the railroad station, because in Theresienstadt was no railroad at the time, but we went there to the nearest station, and we came there, they said no train to Prague till the next morning. So we went into a restaurant there to have dinner, and on a white table cloth with napkins, not paper napkins, but real napkins for material, everything so clean and neat, and I started crying. I said, what do you cry this? I said, this is the first time he that somebody served me with real hardware, on a white tablecloth, like that I'm back a human. I'm not an animal no more. I'm human. So I ate something. Of course, they didn't have meat at that time, but they have knedliki, what they call like, uh, what to, like knedels, you know, something like this. Uh, and from, from potatoes with some onions, it is, with a good vegetable soup, with a tea, and then went to bed, and I cried all night long. It was such a clean bed all white bedding with two pillows and my God, like a king, I felt. And then I realized that, that I'm back a human being and I start crying because in camp you couldn't cry. You didn't have the time to think about it, how bad you off. You just wanted to survive. That's all. You didn't think anything. You just thought just to survive and you, like a wounded animal that I lived all day long. And then I realized where are my parents, where's my home, who, who's alive, who's not alive. And it came to me. Then I had the hardest time. And to a lot of people, which they say this is, the liberation was one of the hardest days for us. Like in all the cities all over Europe, in the United States, in London, they have parades, they have dancing in the street. You, you saw films. But for us, we didn't have where to go didn't want to go back to Poland because we suffered there a lot too. So we came finally, the train came, there was no place on the train. Thousands of people. And they on the roof. So my brother pushed me up on the roof. He came up on the roof. He laid flat, holding on dear life on the edge there. That's for about an hour. And we, and we arrived in Prague. In Prague we got off, so he took me to the hotel, where the uh, Hotel Flora, I think it was. Nice hotel, and there where he was when he came to Prague, and they put all refugees there for nothing. The Czech people were so nice. I mean, not a nation the world would do for refugees out from the camps what the Czech people did. Every corner, every street corner, had kiosk with big tables, and it's written Czeske Serce in Czech, the Czech heart, a red heart. You have broads with butter, with cheeses, with egg, and milk, and coffee, you name it, as much as you want, every corner, because they knew they all came to Czechoslovakia, going back to Poland, going back to Hungary or something. This was the point, and they treated us so nice. While I'm there, at waiting for food, who comes in, was a girl there that they chased her out from Czechoslovakia. She was in our city.
they were three sisters and a mother. So he says, well, I have my own home now, not by you anymore. <laughs> like this. He was said all three survived. Yes, but not the mother. And we were there for a while. In fact, I met there a nice girl, a young girl. She was already 20, 21. She was so happy they used to have a drugstore in our city, not far. Vinograd. And she gave me right to add us, oh, she has an apartment in Prague. They gave an apartment. So where to go, she wrote me down which street car. I didn't know how, what and when, you know. Which check, I didn't know check. So there was a lady near the street car, and I showed her which one to take. They was, I mean, unbelievable how nice she had a baby in her hand. She took me on the street car, went with me, didn't explain to me where it is, to make sure I arrived there, and then I knocked at the door, I met her, she made like dinner, you know what she ever had in this, and then I left. I thought maybe she's a remain, I don't know, I didn't meet her anymore. And I was there for about in Prague for 10 days. I would have stayed longer, but what happened? In the middle of the night, I slept on the third bunks. There were bunks in the hotel. They didn't regular bed because there were so many people, refugees. Came out a group of Polish women. They were the ones that they walk in the fields. A hefty woman, you know, very rough. And my brother and me started jumping down. And they started yelling in the worst Polish language. Where the heck do you think you're going? They, grab, they wanted probably sex or whatever. They, they didn't know that we are sick. We could hardly walk, you know, poor. So I ran off. In my pyjama, they too open light, but I ran. My brother law grabbed his shoes from underneath and ran away so fast. <laughs> we didn't go back, pick up our stuff even. <laughs> and I came and I washed myself in the bathroom. So in the bathroom, my brother in was already outside <coughs> waiting, and comes in a young guy, a redhead, freckled. Oh, and he asked me in a nice Polish language, can I loan him the cup he wants to brush his teeth also? The way how he talked, and I saw he's a redhead, freckled, so I knew this must be his son that I went on his passport. Because his son was a redhead, but I never met him because they were in Warsaw and we lived in Silesia. Yes, my father went all the time to Warsaw. And his mother, my sister, lived, lived in Warsaw. So he said, Monik, like my name, he's named after the same grandfather. Yeah. And he jumped on me, started crying, kissing, and oh boy was this. And I remember we went to Prague and we were all in a different hotel we stood for a couple of days. He said, come on, we are going to have a good time. And he was a sportsman, I mean, the Vultava River, they were, you know, kayaks there. So, come on, we are going to go in the kayak on the river. And I went with him. You no, know, he, he's used to these things. And what happened, he saw two Russian soldiers with two girls. And he knew Russian. I know how. He knew so many languages. And he started yelling at the girls, come on, we can eat one girl here. <laughs> the, the Russian, he wanted to kill him. He ran with him, but we ran so fast, we left the kayak and ran away. <laughs> I never forget. I all time tell him this. <laughs> I told his wife. <laughs> what the, he was a character. Okay, and then my brother said, you know, it's time. I don't want to be here on the Russian zone. We are going to go over in the, on the Czechoslovakian border where the Americans are because I don't bother, I says, but look, Shabda, they liberated me. They're nice. He said, they're nice. Stalin is any better than Hitler. Hmm. He said, we are going to smuggle ourselves over to the uh, American side, and then we go to Palestine from there. From there, we go to Romania or something, to Germany. We are going to go illegal to Palestine. He already knew about something, because he was in Budapest also. So we come on the train. He says, don't forget, when the border police comes, the American MP, military police, when the Russian soldiers get off, 
tell them you are from Germany, not from Poland. If you say from Poland, they ship you right back, go back to Poland, is on the other side. But you from Germany, you go back to Germany, which happened. But it was him, his son, and myself. His son was about 17 years old. The American MP came up, I says, boy, this is soldiers. They look so handsome, tall, elegant with their nice sport shoes, not the heavy boots like the Russians or the Germans. Sporty, beautiful to the MP, think how beautiful they look so handsome. And he started talking with them English, that he spoke a better English than, than the Americans. He, he was talking English, yeah, because they have a mate. She, she only spoke French and English to them. So they knew French and English better than Yiddish, like you say. They spoke very little Yiddish, yes. So they says, how come you know English? That must be spies or something. A guy, young guy, no, he speaks such a view of English. So they took him off. So my father said, don't worry, you go, we find you. I said, I was scared a little bit, you know, by myself right after the war. Okay, I went over, we came, we came to the American side. It stopped in Pilsner. This was the border, and there was the big station Pilsner. It was about two in the morning I arrived. Cold as can be. Come on the station, the American soldiers laying on the ground, on the station, on the outside, on the cement, but they have sleeping bags with blankets, heavy blankets, and I was shivering. I didn't have a jacket, just a shirt, and May is cold. So I went in between, I start pulling the blanket, I start pulling the blanket, they pull back all the couple, I fell asleep. I wake up, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning, cold and shivering, there are no, no soldiers, there are no blankets, on the cold cement. So I got up, I could hardly walk, and I went to the police. I asked where the police is, and I told them the time from the camp, I'm Polish, so they told me, don't say you're Polish. Say they, you a Jew from Poland. They hated the Poles like they hated the Germans. Because in 38, when Germany occupied Czechoslovakia, Poland went into Zaolje, the Karpaty mountains there. They claimed that this belongs to Poland. So there was a battle for two days. And the only victim, the only soldier that died was a Jewish soldier. His name was Moshe Oise. I remember like now, it can't get out from my head. Because in the papers it was written, I said, there were only a small percentage of Jews, 10% in the Polish army, and has to be a Jew that got killed. What was it? The meal or something? You know, by the way, you start thinking about it. Yeah. But that's what I remember. So they were angry. Just tell them, you were Jewish from Poland. It's different. Then they gave me food. They, gave, they made eggs for me with the roll and butter and thing, and they gave me 10 kroner with a pack of cigarettes, and if you want to join the Communist Party, you get everything double, double money, double cigarettes. Do I care I'm a communist? What did I know about communists? <laughs> so I signed something, they, they gave me a little lapel here to wear, you know, a red thing. I belong to the Communist Party. He says, with this, with your certificate you have, every police station, we have to take you in and give you food. I said, I'm now in seven heaven. No. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave me to sleep to the scouts. And the scouts were so nice to me. When they heard I'm from camp, the scouts were about 18, 20 years old with the machine guns and this. They were like soldiers in the barrack. Everybody gave me money. I have so much money. It says, well, what goes the money? Where will I go with the money? Cigarettes. So my, how much can I put in a shower? They took me to the next station. And the trains didn't go at that time. I have to walk on foot, and, but they took me on jeeps. And about on the third day, I asked at every police station for any Jewish people a day. Finally, I came to Strakonice. So the police told me, yeah, we have some Jewish girls on the hospital day. I couldn't wait. They told me where it is. I went to the hospital day. So I asked them, they, I heard here some. Jewish girls. Yes, but you can see them. What do you mean I can see them? They're sick on typhus. In quarantine, we don't let them. They're on the second floor, which all metal, you know, grades there that they can't jump out or nothing. 
and they wouldn't let me in. I start crying, I won't see who's there. I'm a Jewish guy and the Jewish girl thing. They didn't let me. Must be that the nurse must go up there and tell him that the Jewish boy is here. <coughs> As I walk out, I heard the yell, Monik, Monik and Paul, she knows me, I'm Bala Zigle. Morris, Morris, don't you, don't you recognize me? I'm Bala Zigle, a neighbor of mine. And she was with me in camp, in the women's camp. I told you I woman camp. So first thing I ask her, where's Bluma, my sister? Where Bluma escaped, they were shooting after her, but I don't know if she's alive or not. But if you go to Volari, there is the rest of the transport and they will know more than I do. We are here, five girls, second typhus, and that's it. So we spoke for about, we both cried, and I said, where's Volari? Where you ask where it is and you will wind up there. There is a big hospital. Going down, I picked some white flowers, you know, in the fields, you know, the white flowers. I went over there to a nurse that she should give it to her, to Bala. Okay. Finally, on the next day, somebody took me to the there, a scout. And I come to Volare, which is called Bala in German. And I go to the police. So I go to the police and ask them if there are some Jewish girls I heard in the hospital. Oh yeah. He took me right over. I walked for about 10 minutes in a big hospital. He says, this is a hospital. I walk in. Who stays there on the top of the steps? My best friend's sister from my city, because most of them were from my city at that transport. And she gave out, she was hysterical home, but you can imagine there when she saw me. Oh, you know, oh, worse. She jumped down, she didn't jump down, she jumped down all the steps, she almost killed me. Because it was very narrow between the wall and this, we both fell. Uh, I tell you, she didn't have no sense. And she started crying this, oh, and everybody, she yelled so bad that everybody who was well enough came down running, who, what is it, what is it? So some of them recognized me, because I was with them camp for almost a year. Okay, I went up. I got to know them this, so she took me right away to the cemetery there, it wasn't far, and she told me my sister died just yesterday. She didn't make it. She survived, but she couldn't make it. Fella, the older sister, very highly intelligent girl. And there were about 45 graves there, which they couldn't make it. And I was with them, so the first night, I didn't have where to sleep, because I just came. So what did they do? They put me down with a 14-year-old girl in the same bed. What's a 14-year-old girl I'm thinking? Who, who thought about it? And the next day, and the next day they put a curtain there, like a shower curtain, and I slept near the window in the same room. So I slept there. I was with them for three months. Yes, they didn't let me go. I, they thought that I'm the only guy alive, the only <laughs> Jewish guy alive. And for my city, they let me go. And this girl we became the best friend. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, her husband, a good friend of mine, we talk very often to each other. They lived in Teaneck, New Jersey. In fact, I won't tell her husband I slept bef with her for before you did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an air. No, he wouldn't mind anyway at that time. No. He, 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 no. At that time, it, it was accepted. It, it, it was not at that time, because believe me, that uh, boys were sleeping with girls together. They, 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 just talking about it. I know because when we were together with the girls, that's what happened. And it, nothing went on, but we were, we were like one family. And there was a, a rabbi, a rabbi, Jewish chaplain. He says, "Well, you well everything. I give you a job." So he gave me a job to walk by a, a soldier from a doctor from Chicago that he spoke Polish. You know, most of Chicago people speak Polish, mm. the Poles, you know. And to walk there in a clinic if any guy gets wounded or something, you know, treat him. So he treated a soldier and gave him a shot, you know, for something. He got cut himself or something. And I fainted. He says, what's the matter? Here I saw dead bodies. 
I saw hanging, slept on that body. It didn't bother me like like a dog would be killed. It didn't touch me. Here he gives him a needle and I faint. It was un unusual. So I came to the chaplain and I said, I can't go back anymore. I fainted. The doctor would tell you. So he put me into work in the kitchen, officer's kitchen, which I helped. They open up those big cans with, with peaches and apple. They make those big pies and I help them put in and cut away the fat from the beans. This is the best part of the meat. This is the best part. And you throw away everything. They didn't eat fat. Bars was more money when it was fat meat. We didn't have that much fat. Well, anyway, so I started stealing oranges and some chocolate that was laying there on the tables. And I have, have a, a string here and I put it down. <laughs> so for the girls in the hospital, there were 120 girls there. So it was survived from 2000. So as I walked out, comes an officer there. Come here, Monica. Unwind. Let everything unwind. Give out everything what you took. I says, you know, it's not for me. I'm not I know it. Take it out. He ripped it open. Come on the jib. He took me on the jib. We came to the PX. Don't you dare to steal. You tell me every time you come to me and you get it, what you He packed up, and I mean boxes with soap. And with uh, toothbrushes, toothpaste, chocolates, cigarettes. They don't smoke. I said, we don't need cigarettes. Food, oranges. Every time you need, he took me to the hospital on the jeep. Don't you steal. I know what's there. They knew it, that they're sick girls. And I remember now on the third floor, we're very sick girl. They and I brought up to her. There were four German. Jewish girls, they all survived. And uh, I remember that after the war, about 10 years ago, he says, I knew a, a Jewish boy there, she didn't know who I am, that brought me oranges every morning. I says, that's me. She couldn't get it over. Mm. And she sends me all time New Year's cards and this. Yes. And that's how I survived. And then came a time after a couple of months, that the check. What year in month was it by the This is 45, in the beginning 45, 45, sure. And then came an order that the American army is going back way because they gave to the Russians all Czechoslovakia back. So they took the girls to Salzburg, which I went with them, because they didn't want to leave the girls with the Russians, but a few of them, they were very sick, they couldn't move them, they remained there. Yes. And then this was the liberation. And in fact, I exhibited in Czechoslovakia 1978. The first time I went, I didn't want back to Poland. This is the first time I went. I said, my God, there are some Jewish girls laying in this cemetery. I'm going to go over. I says, for Larry, where are we going? We don't have trains yet to go over there. You have to take three buses. You got to get up four in the morning because four thirty leaves the first bus. Then they take you so far. It took six hours to go there. This is near the German border in Bavaria. To, today not. Today they have the trains, express trains. Finally, I came back after so many years there, and so I came to the police, and I told them I was here in 1945, and I know there's some girls buried in the cemetery. And I like to visit the cemetery because they don't have nobody to go there. And I, a lot of girls that I knew from my hometown. That policeman took me over. In fact, I started taking pictures. My hands were shaking. I couldn't take it. I was shaking up. So he took with his camera pictures. And he brought me two days later to Prague. He came to the hotel. He brought me all... The, uh, what do you call, not the pictures, but the, the, negatives. the, the negatives, yes. And I gave him right away, I bought him the, uh, a dinner and gave him some money what I had and, and cigarettes. And I asked some other guys to give me cigarettes and I gave him all. And I was so thankful. He asked me if I can send him some book with the artists, all movie actors from, from the United States, <laughs> which I did. And became friends later on. And 
that's 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 how I survived and I am in touch with most of the girls that survived that they with me in the hospital in Israel in Canada still talk to them every year and during the year and we're the best friends they all time they invite me bus bar mitzvah bus and not now now they're old already they don't look the same and we have a gathering there in 1995 for the 50th anniversary of the liberation from Volari, from that camp, the 120 girls. So I propose the mayor of the city, Dvoratsk, I told him, how about inviting all the girls that they were liberated here 50 years ago, and we all will come here. He accepted this, said that's a good idea. But at that time, when I went back in 78, I went back to the mayor of the city. And I said, when I was here, it was only 45 graves. How come it's here 96 graves, 96 girls? It's 95 Jewish girls and one Russian soldier that he got killed in 42. They buried them in a the field. But the Russians, after liberation, took him back. He should be with somebody that suffered also. So they told us, he told us, that a lot of them were found later in the woods, in the Bohemian woods, that they shot them there. And the girls that I met later for the 15th anniversary, they recognized me. Yeah, and some of them, which I'm a new friend, they, they had family with them. And what a holiday. We arrived in Prague to the hotel, and I met there some of the girls. The mayor of the city from Volari came to Prague, introduced us to ma the mayor of the city from Prague. They showed a film that Gerda Weisman, I know if you heard of Gerda Weisman, of a, a survivor from that camp, she made like a film. I have the film here because they wanted I should do with her because I was with her at the Holocaust Museum. I said, no, this is hers, letter, but my name is mentioned that I gave part of the history there. I have it here at the table. And they showed this, and they showed us where the mayor's quarters are, with the governor there, and they gave us a big dinner with champagne, and then we went three buses back to the people. But we stopped first in other cities, towns, where a lot of them managed to escape, and the people from those towns saved them. So the people from the sound, they were waiting with the orchestra there, with flowers. You can imagine, you have to come in, get off the buses, with speeches from them, and with food and drinks. And they and me, while in Volare, they waited for us till 12 o'clock at night. Then they went home. They let them know later we are going to be in the morning day. They waited for us. So you can imagine, next day, they made three days a holiday, with all, all the stores were closed. Flags were hanging, American, French, and Russian flags, all over the windows from the town. The school kids made special presents for each of the girls, and we went there to the schoolyard, and they made, they brought over 95 trees, but we were angry, why did you buy this in Germany? But they say this in German town, which, they, which the mayor was good for, for Jewish people there we didn't want to accept, that we should plant the trees and make a park for the survivors, for the ones that they buried there, 90, 96 trees there. And they put up, and they were buried first in the field, because they couldn't be buried in the Christian cemetery. First of all, the Christians wouldn't allow. Second, the Jewish. You can't bury Jewish people in a Christian cemetery. So they buried them in the field. For the 50th anniversary, before that, they made a Jewish cemetery there with a statue. And they made beautiful stones already. Before it was only triangles. And I said, how come triangles? They told me that the one takes care of the cemetery was himself a prisoner of war, that we wore the triangles. Mm -hmm. So he made triangles. But they made a reed, reed, tombstones already for them, with the names, but most of them they don't know, it's near Znana, unknown, yes. But the cemetery they made, they made it wrong. 
because I have the original pictures. I have 450 pictures I made to give it to the museum, to send to some of the girls, which they as sisters are very there. And so I know exactly there were seven half circles, and I knew everyone would stay. They, when they made the monuments, they just mixed them up. So I was very angry, it's different. I will show you the pictures. Yes. So with this, I think we can finish off. Now I'm going to show you something. Oh, you want we some? We need a few more questions yes. for you. Sorry. Okay. So when, um, when the Valerna got labeled... Volare. Volare, excuse yeah. me. Um, How do you spell that? V-O-L-A-R-Y. Volare. Okay. In German it was Valar. V A L L. A R N. It's different. So you were there for three months, or just about. Yes. And then. Then to Salzburg. You, okay, Salzburg. Yes, I was with the girls, and then I know some of the soldiers got married with the girls. A lot of soldiers got married with those girls. <laughs> oh yeah, they were beautiful. They came to themselves, and beautiful girls. And in Salzburg, they made dances there in the DP camp. And what I hated about that, and I didn't like the Americans too much, because they came some color soldiers, color people soldiers. Mm -hmm. They wanted to dance with the Jewish girls, with the white soldiers, and they threw them out, they were fighting. I said, they were fighting together with you, what do you want, a human being? You know, I suffered, so I know what it means, suffering. So I was angry at them. But the only thing I didn't like it there, because the American soldiers, all the time the hand, those, uh, a case of Coca-Cola, those little bottles of Coke, and dads and chocolates, so the girls will go after them, and they have the nicest German girls there. <laughs> sure. And in fact, I went to make myself a suit, I suppose, to go to Palestine. So I had material, and I went to a tailor there to make me a, a light suit, which I gave away the suit to the museum, in the Holocaust Museum, because this was for Palestine, all white, you know. Linen. So day I come to measure, the first measurement, sits there his daughter, about 25-year-old woman, on the lap on, the, on, a, a, on an American soldier, and he wanted to get good with her on her side, because she's German. Jude, raus. Jew, get out from here. I saw me get out. I'm the, he went and slept me and pushed me out, you hear? Well, I was there near Cafe Weiss where the Jewish community was. I told a couple guys what happened to me, I was bloody in the nose. They waited for him to come out, it was winter time. We came out, it was about eight in the evening dark. I thought they're gonna kill that soldier. They let him have it. They let him have it. And I didn't go back for my suit till a month later. <laughs> I went back there make sure he's not there. <laughs> so what, you went to Sal Salzburg? Yeah, and, then and from, Salzburg, to from Salzburg we went to, went to Germany, to Weiden, because I found a sister there that she escaped to the Soviet Union during the war, and I heard she's alive, and uh, so I went to Regensburg there, and she moved to Weiden, so I moved back to Weiden. Jesse, can you get out? Yeah. Okay. Because he's going somewhere. Yes. What so, happened to your uh, brother-in-law, your sister's hus husband? Because well, he became, he became the only Jewish uh, newsman that he was allowed to go to the Nuremberg trials, mm -hmm. you know, for the Nazis. And I was there seven times. He could take along two guests with him. And I have the tickets, I gave some museum, some I still have it. Yes. And because you got to have a ticket, you know, the name printed out, it's a souvenir. And I saw everybody there, you know, Himmler and Gehring, not Himmler, Gehring, all the, all, all the artists, they need every one of them. I saw Hess, yes. And it's the fun thing. It was in Nuremberg, it, Nuremberg, the city was all flattened down. I mean, you couldn't walk by there. Glass, top, brick, they, they damaged all the, But where the Nuremberg trials were on, a big, huge building, a whole block long, it wasn't touched. And I went there five years ago, 
it's still there, the same building, I have pictures I made, everything, mm -hmm. yes. And, uh, and then we came to the United States here. What yes. year was that? 1950. But what happened was we supposed to go to Palestine. That was our thing, because my sister was already in Palestine. She went with the Exodus ship. Mm -hmm. She was on the Exodus. And my other sister from Russia was also in Palestine, then became, of course, Israel. But what happened, I still have the paper. My best friend started to be a doctor in Biden, and he went to Palestine, illegal, on the ship through Marcel, yes, and he got killed the first, the minute he arrived, they put him right away on the front in Jerusalem, got killed the first hour. He didn't know any Hebrew or anything. Two of my friends got killed. So my younger brother said, look, we lived through a war. Why should we get killed now? He says, we have two ends in New York. They send affidavits for us. I says, from Palestine to come to the United States, you won't be able to come. But from the United States, you can all time go to Palestine, which is true. Yes, so I'm here. I had a brother here that he was, he, he lived in Palestine before the war, my oldest, and his wife was from Baltimore. When the war broke out in 48, they burned his door. She was American, American citizen. She had two young kids. So they came over here to Baltimore. They were from Baltimore, so that's why I came here. So Baltimore was the first place you came to? To New York first. New York so first. what happened, I stood by my nephew, the one, that I told you, uh, I, I came on his paper out from Theresian, and he speaks so many languages that he was translator for General Clark. You heard about General Clark, the, the, you know, the, the main general for Austria and this, and he was his translator. I have a lot of pictures I will show you with all the soldiers. He knew French, he knew, knew Russian, he knew English, he knew German. So I have the pictures in Vienna where all four, if you see films, you see all the four soldiers from each county, the French, the French, and the American, and the British, yeah, and the Russian. And he translated every morning, oh, you are going to make me full. Come on, there's a dark pants, but get off, get off from the sofa. <laughs> and so, he translated in all the languages what they should do that day, and then I have him when he gave it. What do you want to fight? <laughs> 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 and then, uh, and then I have one picture where General Clark actually speaks in Vienna, in the middle of the market, for the people from the Germans, and he stays with them in civilian clothes, or, and he translates everything in German. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you arrive on the boat? Did yeah. you see the Statue General, of Liberty? Sure. General Sturgis. It's what's a funny ride. I think I have the worst of it. Why? Because it was, a, I called it a pickle boat. That's what it was. It was shaking like, oh. So everybody got sick and they started kind of, oh, why did I have to come to the United States and die in the ocean? You don't know what the feeling it is when you get seasick. It's the worst feeling you have. You throw up every minute, mm -hmm. you know, when you throw up how you feel. And I was the one smiling and left my head like a horse. Everybody was sick. I was the only one eating. I had the best food I had. And I, so I said, what the heck is the matter with those people? But we came two days before New York. It took eight days. Everybody was well, then somebody threw up and I got nauseated and I started and I got sick like a dog. And when we arrived here, I saw the statue arrive this, but my head wasn't on. I was so sick. Mm -hmm. My two aunts were waiting for us with my younger brother in New York. Imagine we go out from the ship. I was sick like a dog. She wants to go Fifth Avenue, buy me a suit with the hat and this. Yeah, right away. No, I don't want a suit now and this, I don't feel with this. Okay, she bought me a silk shawl, a white, I still have for souvenir, I even don't wear it. <laughs> Beautiful. She bought me shirts, then we sat down, we eat, and I, why don't you eat? I couldn't. <laughs> so the next day I start feeling, yeah, and she took us after dinner, which I couldn't eat, to Radio City Music Hall, the same evening where I came from the ship sick. 
And I was afraid I shouldn't snow. I was so sick and tired. My brother, every man should, don't fall asleep. How couldn't I fall asleep? I, you know, the, the nicest show, this, it, it made such impression on me, a radio city, music hall. First of all, the big buildings, tall buildings in New York, right? But I couldn't enjoy. I was too sick to enjoy. And it was a good film. And later on, what do you think she does? After, after going out for Radio City Music, she goes to Lindy's where all the movie stars go for, for cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> she meant good. The next two days, uh, my friend came. So, she, oh, did she make a dinner for us, for my friends. And then she went to buy me a suit. So she bought a suit for my friend too. So my friend was so, my, he's like a mother. He went and bought a big crystal that he brought from Germany. <laughs> What, what do you want? Yeah. And um, so how long did you stay in New York? In New York, what happened? She said, I will, she will, I be her son. I won't walk anymore, you have it good, you walked enough. Uh, uh, uh. I like to be independent because I went to look for a job. She didn't let me. So then I had a brother here, I said, no, I'm not going to stay with her. I like to be independent. What do you mean I'm going to stay by her and do nothing? Here, I came over to the United States, I came to Baltimore, so the first thing I did, I didn't know any English or anything, so I went for English first, number one school on Green Street, Green and something, yeah, across the street from where Edgar Poe is buried, the cemetery, mm -hmm. I don't think of the schools anymore there, then I went to the Polytechnic, and then I went to the Maryland Institute of Art. So I went seven years mm. and post-graduated. Last year was our alumni, 50 years. Mm. So they invited me and we had a nice time there, showed us everything around. And I'm very proud. I wasn't too much. I, I, what did I go? I went seven years in school, seventh grade, the war broke out and my education stopped. I thought I would go to university, college first, university. It stopped everything, and I think this is what bothers me the most. Because I could be somebody, I could be something, and my schooling was taken away from me in the best years. So I decided at least have something. Of course, I read a lot of books on my own, educated myself after. And I went for English one, two, three. I finished everything in English, but. How much? When you have to work eight, ten hours a day, you have to make a living. I didn't work except for nobody anything, which they offered me I would never do. In fact, I helped out people. When I made $16 a week, I still sent to, us, uh, to my friends a package. Where were you month. working at that point? Hmm? Where were you working at that point? I was working here different. I, first of all, in the ghetto, I was painting. I told you I, mm -hmm. I was a painter. So I wanted to buy a grocery store and I did some painting here for the people that they made the, You heard about the Exodus ship, right? Mm -hmm. And came out from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And for the Mr. Spear, the one that was responsible for the ship, yeah. that loaded the ship, the, the, you know, with food and, and the arms and everything. And this is the ship, the Exodus ship, that my sister was on it. In fact, Oh, I can bring over the si your sister here. Yeah, when she was on the Exodus. No, she wouldn't come. She's angry that I'm not there. <laughs> yes, and uh, so she started crying, his wife. Oh, what a woman. Yeah. And very aristocratic. Yeah. And he says, no, you, you were a very intelligent fellow. You would never be able to get married. You go to a grocery, you will walk like, like a slave, 16 hours a day, sleep with a where you have the store, and she got me scared, and I had a lawyer already to go into a store, and I stopped. So then I went uh, to the Maryland Institute and became a decorator and everything, so I did combine, and I was never listed in a phone book. I have so many, my clientele, that I just didn't want people should call me. I have too much, I couldn't take it that many. I had enough people, and I didn't want to have 20 people working for me, not, not to have uh, a handle on them, you know. What, so. what was the year when you moved from New York to Baltimore? It was in 90, 
also 1950, because I didn't stay you... too long there. Okay. I stood about two months, that's all. And while you went to school and work, did you uh, make it known that you're a survivor of the Holocaust? How did that fit into your new life? It wasn't easy. I was nervous. I went to the doctor twice, three times a week. He gave me pills to quiet down. What do they call? They still use them today. And not only this, later on I was very angry. He gave me samples and he charged me 10 cents for each pill, which this was illegal. But he took advantage. What did I make? $16 a week. I paid him $2 for the visit. That's what was at that time, $2 deducted, then 5 and charged me 10 cents for a pill. Yes. So then, after two years, I was so nervous and this, so I went to another doctor, Canadian doctor, Dr. Schwartz, but he passed away since then. He says, look, either you throw away the pills, because you're already addicted to it, and you will get sick, you will die, or you're a young man, you can live. Throw away the pills. He took from me the pills, he threw them away. Do you have a hobby or something? I says, yes, I used to have stamps. Go back to your stamps. Oh. Yes. Oh. <laughs> and I remember in 1960, I had a, a operation, a hernia operation, because I lived at the piano by myself <laughs> to put away from one room to the other. You know. <laughs> so I had a hernia at that time for a hernia, you were three weeks in the hospital. I couldn't eat or nothing. And I told I was so scared, don't be scared. The good doctor said, I said, doctor, you go and come. I says, why should I come that you should have to pay me for a visit? They have good, good doctors there and good nurses. Anyway, he came to see me twice. And I couldn't eat. I couldn't eat for a week, nothing. I was so, I couldn't get up from bed. My sister came from Israel and I was fainting all the time I got up from bed because I was 10 days in bed. And he pushed in food to me, he says, you got to eat, you got to get up. And he walked with me around, didn't pay, take a penny. This is a doctor, Canadian doctor. And, and then I was operated, just two years later it came back. But two years later they threw me out right away. <laughs> the, minute, the minute I got up, and this I better think. I started walking right away, not laying three weeks in the hospital. And in fact, there was an Italian guy with me in the same room. We joked around. And you know, after an operation, you couldn't move your bowels. It's terrible. So he left to me, he wanted I should smile. He says, now tell me, Morris, what do you should prefer? A nice blonde girl, a nice blonde nurse comes into you now all alone? Or do you prefer a bowel movement? <laughs> I said, give me a bowel movement, take the girls. <laughs> and I will never forget, that's an Italian guy. <laughs> he, had a, he has a stand in the market, an Italian. Very nice, he came to my house with Maria, his wife. <laughs> I, I left so much, and the nurse left, when she had, if you have a nice blonde, would you prefer the blonde or bowel? I said, give me a bowel <laughs> I never forget this. <laughs> this was funny. <laughs> yeah. So, speaking of girls, yeah. when did you meet your wife? Well, this was a blind date <laughs> that I met oh. my wife. This was in '53. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Where is she from? She's from Baltimore. She was from Baltimore. Here, yeah, yes. Yeah, nice, very nice. But she didn't like too much. I used to have a lot of company. I like company. And she was more, you know, on the quiet side, yes. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I used to travel so much, six, seven times a year overseas. And she didn't want to go along. No, you go along. I trust you, she says. I know. <laughs> but I, so she went with me. She went to England with me. She was in Holland, in Belgium, uh, with me this. But she didn't want to go. And, but my sons, I took my sons to Italy for the international games. Mm -hmm. And... To London and uh, I took my son around to Greece. Yes, for the hundredth anniversary of the Olympics, mm. he was with me, with Mrs. Clinton. Wow. Yeah, I will show you pictures from her. Can we pause really fast and switch the hmm? tape? 